Greetings everybody, Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12, you know the deal. I probably said it a thousand times. This is going to be part 22 of the Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright series. Let's see, this is going to be, we're getting close to the, closer to the end of the book. Uh, let's see, part three of the book chapter four this is called dan d-a-n dan was one of the 12 tribes dan the serpent's trail that's the title this is page 259 of this book if you're interested in learning more about dan I have a playlist, boy, I got a lot of playlists, huh, um, where I go in-depth with Dan. Uh, it's called Dan the Pioneer of Israel, another book, re another book review by, uh, I think it was Fowler, F-A-W-L-E-R. Uh, I got to look that up. Oh, I was wrong. It's called Dan, Pioneer of Israel by J.C. Gowler, G-A-W-L-E-R. And he was the um, keeper of the crown jewels in England. And he wrote this book around 1880. See, people, people have known this stuff for a while. And uh, I noticed all the books, companies that sell this book, uh, Norton says that it's a suspected bad site. Oh, his name is John Cox Gowler, G-A-W-L-E-R. Um, let's see. Now, the... Um, like I say, I did a book review on that, and it's probably a lot of the same information. I don't remember. I have read so many different books um, in the 30-some-odd years uh, that I've been a believer. It's hard for me to remember everything. But um, I-S-H-ish means man in Hebrew. So when you're talking about the Danish D-A-N-I-S-H, that's what they call themselves, the Danish, the Danish, Dan Man, or the Man of Dan, or the Scottish, or the Brit British, or the Irish, uh, <laughs> you know, people just don't get the connection. You know, Christianity never flourished in the Far East. Did Christianity ever flourish in China or India or Japan or Mongolia? No. No, never. You know, there's a reason. It flourished in Europe, among Europeans. And I know there's, you know, people will argue that, you know, it's for the whole world. Well, whatever. Believe whatever you want. If it's for the whole world, then open up the floodgates for immigration and bring in everybody that wants to come to Europe and America and hand them a welfare check and say, God bless you. I don't believe that, but... And oh, by the way, I was watching a, um, a documentary. I don't remember might have been History Channel from years and years ago before they did Porn Stars and American Nose Pickers and all that other stupid garbage. Um, they found a sunken Viking longship that was buried what, uh, in the mud in a uh, what they call a ford, a fjord. Um, it's like a mountainous river, I guess. And it was very well preserved. 
very well. So they excavated it, brought it out, took a look at it, looked at the building techniques uh, that they had used. And I'm not sure if they repaired it and used it or built something similar dimensions and with modern wood and what have you. But supposedly they used the traditional methods to build this uh, Viking longship. And they had a, what's called a very low draft, uh, which means the, the, the ship floated pretty high on the water, which meant that you could go into rivers and you wouldn't get stuck on the bottom with shallow, shallow rivers. And they would go way inland with these rivers, with these long ships, and uh, be able to attack settlements or what have you you know the vikings that's what they were that's what they were uh, famous for matter of fact england had a uh, at least one viking king you ever seen those uh the the when they do the changing of the guard at buckingham palace with the redcoats they call them the bee feeders that came from that came from denmark the, da the Danish do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, the Danish didn't adopt it from the English. The English adopted it from the Danish, from their uh, Danish king. I forget. They had at least one Danish king, maybe more. But, um, yeah. You know, Eric the Red, probably one of the more famous Vikings. Well, when you look up in the king james bible in the hebrew when day king david uh was ruddy uh says red hair with freckles in the hebrew in strong's concordance the old one the old strong's not the modern one so you know it makes you wonder uh revelation one says jesus had white head and white hair was he blonde you know, said he has eyes as a flame of fire. I used to think that was red eyes, you know, like an albino. But um, have you ever looked at a gas stove flame? What color is it? Blue. Jet blue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, makes you wonder. But um, my point was those Viking longships, they went from, well, Denmark and Norway all the way to Iceland, which was, I think it was um, seven, 800 miles. Um, I'm not sure how many kilometers that would be. And then from Iceland, they went to Greenland, which is uh, not that far off the coast of America, Canada. And supposedly... The Vikings came to America, but the Indians didn't particularly care for them. So they, you know, they fought them and attacked them. And, you know, one of those Viking ships could only hold 20 or 30 people. So, you know, if you're fighting an entire uh, tribe of Indians, uh, even though you had superior weapons, well, I don't know about that. You know, bows and arrows are pretty effective, you know, but they had shields and what have you. But um, I don't know. I don't know. They, uh, it makes you wonder. But those Viking longships could travel quite, quite a distance. So, all right, I looked it up real quick. Uh, 700 miles would be 1,100 kilometers or kilometers, whatever you, you know. And yes, I was in Europe for a while, so I'm I was somewhat familiar with uh, the metric system. Uh, most Americans, no clue. But all right, so I've been jibber jabbering for almost ten minutes now. Let's let's read the book. Dan, the Serpent's Trail. The question naturally arises: How did the prince? the highest branch of the cedar of Lebanon, get to the Isles of the Sea. 
To get to the bottom of that which is involved in the reply to this question, we will need to understand some of the characteristics and acquaint ourselves with some of the prophecies which pertain to the tribe of Dan. The prophecies which dying Jacob gave concerning what the posterity of each of his sons was to become in the last days. Bob's note here. Do you know that Jacob Israel in Genesis was telling that there was, you know, he was giving prophecies of what would happen to his seed, his children, in the last days. Yeah. And Christians won't bother to read it because, well, that's for the you-know-whos. That's not for the church. Fools. And then they bless those that curse and hate Jesus. And you wonder why God blinds their eyes. You know? Somebody cursed and hated my family. I'm not going to invite them over for a family dinner. And I'm not going to say, God bless you. No. Or Godspeed, as the Bible says. The Bible says, if any bring not the doctrine of Christ, don't bring them into your house. Don't bid them Godspeed, because that makes you a partaker of their evil deeds. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but I think you get the idea. You know? You're going to bless the enemies of Jesus Christ? You're a fool. That's why people can't hear. They can't hear the things when you're trying to warn them about all this stuff. God blinds them. You know? All you got to do is spend 15 minutes researching how they really feel about Jesus from their own websites. You don't need to, to listen to me. Read their own writings. You know? Yeah. And you'd be like, man, I'm not going to bless these people. You know, there's a reason why a certain group of people have been booted out of over a hundred and something different places through the years. You know? Yeah. The prophecies which dying Jacob gave concerning what the posterity of each of his sons was to become in the last days is recorded in the 49th chapter of Genesis. In the 17th verse is a part of the prophecy concerning the tribe of Dan. The first clause of which, according to the King James translation, reads as follows. Dan shall be a serpent by the way. Now he says, but a better translation is as follows. Dan shall be a serpent's trail. Um, Bob's note here. Have you ever noticed how a snake moves? It moves from side to side to go forward. And I believe that's what he's alluding to. That Dan would be all over the place uh, but moving forward. And some people have interpreted this saying that Dan's going to be uh, a serpent. And I'm not so sure. Um, people will notice that in Revelation, Dan is not in the 144,000. However, uh, in I think it's Ezekiel, in the millennial kingdom, if I remember correctly, don't quote me on this, uh, Dan is mentioned. Dan is absolutely mentioned. Absolutely. Um, but uh, I, I believe some people will say Dan was a serpent. Uh, Dan was also tied in with the uh, Phoenicians, which were maritime traders. Uh, T-R-A-D-E-R-S. Um, they were 
tied in with Carthage, which uh, Rome had battles with because they had an incredible navy. And the Romans figured out a way that they had uh, basically troop carrying ships and they would get near the Carthage ships and then they had a plank with a spike on it and they would lower the spike onto the Carthage ships. The spike would, like a nail, would crash into the ship and then you've got a, a bridge from your ship to their ship and you got Roman soldiers fighting Carthage, Carthage, Carthage sailors. So, uh, yeah, they eventually destroyed Carthage. Uh, they were, you could read about the Phoenicians. They were probably tied in with Dan. I, I, I don't know. They were probably tied in with the Canaanites. You know, there was a lot of intermarriage, a lot of inter intermarriage with the Canaanites, a lot. And I bet you, if you traced back all the politicians for whatever countries, they're probably all, they're probably all traced back to the Canaanites. Genesis 6, Job 38, fallen angels, the whole deal, which nobody believes nowadays because the churches have been infiltrated and destroyed from within. Uh, perhaps you've heard of Hannibal crossing the Alps with the elephants. Um, they don't even teach this history anymore. But uh, he was a Carthage, uh, son of a Carthage ruler. I'm not sure if he was a general or a king or whatever. But uh, he wanted to destroy Rome. And he had a, a large army. And he would conquer, you know, city to city in Italy, modern day Italy. And uh, there were two Roman generals that were sharing uh, rulership, you know, and they had totally different philosophies. The one general, I, I don't remember exactly how long, it was like one would be in charge for like, I don't know, maybe a week or a month. And then the other one would be in charge for a week or a month or whatever. But uh, the one general wanted to do a massive uh, attack and defeat Hannibal. The other one said, nope, let's hold back, block his path, do what is called guerrilla warfare. Uh, that's where you, um, and no, we're not talking about a monkey or an ape, but uh, what you do is you know the area, they don't. They're in a totally unfamiliar area. So they don't know where to get food. They don't know which direction to travel in. And when they sent out scouting parties to figure out, you know, well, where's the food? Uh, you know, because you need to supply your army. You know, they had no supplies coming to them. They were totally on their own, this, this military unit. So they had to find food, whether it was in the forest or in a city that they conquered. And what they would do is they would uh, ambush the scouting parties. So he would send out, Hannibal would send out a scouting party to find food and the scouting party would never return because they were killed. And then they would ambush them. They would find out which way they were going and then lie in wait and then attack them. And then by the time Hannibal uh, figured out who was attacking him and from where, they would leave. So you kill off a portion of their troops and lose almost nobody of your own. I mean, imagine if you're going through, they're going through a valley and your people are hiding in the mountains and you're uh, throwing spears down at them and, and bow and arrows. And uh, before the, and then by the time they start to counterattack, 
your people disappear into the woods or into the mountains. I mean, and uh, finally, the Romans uh, set up a trap and uh, they set up a bunch of campfires and the Carthage army under Hannibal attacked, but it was a trap. Uh, there was nobody at the camp. And then everybody else was up in the mountains. Well, it was like a valley. And they were raining down rocks and, well, huge rocks. Not just small stones, big rocks, you know, weighed 10, 20 pounds, maybe more. Arrows, uh, spears, and... Uh, and then they, after they killed a big portion of them, they came down and engaged them. I believe that general was Fabian. Perhaps you've heard of the Fabians, Fabian Society. Um, they were of the opinion that instead of doing a direct assault, just take your time and pick them apart little by little, whittle them down until you held a massive advantage and then wipe them out. And that's what uh, the Fabian or Fabius or whatever his name was, the general, uh, did to Hannibal, the Carthage general. And eventually they were, he was defeated because, you know, when, you, when you've got a massive army and you can't feed them, everybody's hungry, you can't fight when you haven't eaten in properly in days so but uh, you know there's a reason why Paul wrote an epistle to the book of called the book of Romans if the some of the Romans some of them if some of the Romans were not Israelites he would not have written that book so all right so Dan was to travel in a serpent's trail. So let's keep reading um, the book. You know, there's a lot of inhabited islands in the Mediterranean that have been inhabited for many, many, many years. There's a reason for that. They, Dan abode by ships and they were, they were travelers. They would uh, trade do trade, you know? They would get spices from one place and travel to another and sell them. And other types of goods, so. All right, let's keep reading this book. In the division of the land by lot. Now remember, Israel was given a portion of the land. Of the 12 tribes, the only tribe that was not given a portion of the land were the Levites, the Levitical priesthood. They were to serve God in the tabernacle. There, that's why the tithe was invented. The, the tithe was to feed them and give them provisions. Boy, you never hear this stuff in a church. Never. So, and by the way, when uh, a preacher starts talking about tithing the tithes were only only for the tribe of Levi so if your preacher cannot prove to you that he's a Levite of the tribe of Levi he's not entitled to the tithe he's not entitled to it now an offering that's a whole nother story you want to do an offering you know help somebody out that's that's totally different God said he God says he loves a cheerful giver. You know, it's more blessed to give than to receive, right? At least that's what Jesus said. But tithing is, uh, it's a lie. The lie of the tithe doesn't exist. Unless, of course, they can trace their ancestry back to Levi, which they can't. So in the division of the land by lot, a narrow strip and seacoast country west of Ephraim and Benjamin fell to Dan. 
but this country soon became too small for the tribe, as we are told in the following. The coast of the children of Dan went out too little for them. Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against Leshem and took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and possessed it and dwelt therein and called Leshem Dan after the name of Dan, their father. See, they, they took the city and they renamed it Dan. And you can read about that in the book of Joshua 19 and verse 47. Concerning the Danites, we have also the following. And there went from thence of the family of the Danites out of Zorah and out of Eshtaol, E-S-H-T-A-O-L, 600 men appointed with weapons of war, and they went up and pitched in Kirjath, Jerem in Judah, wherefore they called that place Ma Anna Dan unto this day. And that's in Judges 18, 11 and 12. Again, as we are told concerning this same company of 600 that they came to Laish, a people that were at quiet and secure, and they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. And they built a city and dwelt therein, and they called the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their father, who was born into Israel, howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. And that's in Judges 18 and 29. A company of Danites went to Leshem, and it became Dan. A company of Danites went to Kirjath, Jerem and it became Mahane Mahane Dan. They went on to Laish and it ceased to exist, but they left their trail, i.e., Dan, the name of their father, and thus their trail can be traced not only from Dan to Beersheba, but to the islands of the sea, both by land and by water. For Dan had an inland country and a coast country. The inland company of Dan Danites went west with the overland column, and the ship and the coast company went by water, for Dan abode in his ships. All right, let's read a couple things about Dan. Um, let's see. In Genesis 49, 16, it says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. The word Dan means judge. Yeah. And Daniel, L is a contraction for Lord or God. So Daniel actually means judge of God or God's judge. In verse 17, we read, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. Very, very important. All right, so in Judges 5, 17, Gilead abode beyond Jordan, and why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. And why did Dan remain in ships? I mean, that tells you right there. Dan remained in ships. All right, so let's keep reading. Thus we have the prophecy concerning the ships of Tarshish, i.e. the ends of the world. Um, Bob's note here, Tarshish is generally considered, some people think it was Greece, but I think it was Spain. So, uh, a lot of people don't know it, but if you look at a map, Spain, uh, 
southernmost part of Spain on the Mediterranean is not too far from um, northern Africa. A little passage there in the Mediterranean. So, so let's see. Tarshish, the end of the world. Be still. In other words, silent. Ye inhabitants of the isles, thou whom the merchants of Zidon that pass over the sea have replenished. Isaiah 23 and verse 2. Also in the sixth verse is the following. Pass ye over to Tarshish, howl, ye inhabitants of the isle. Is this your joyous city, Tyre, whose iniquity is of ancient days? Her own feet, means of travel, shall carry her afar off to sojourn. In these scriptures, we are informed that the isles of the sea were replenished by the ships whose seaports were Tyre and Zidon, which were ports of Palestine. Also the people whom, by whom the islands were replenished or peopled are commanded to keep silent, just as the same prophet in another place commands Israel in the islands to keep silent until they should renew their strength. When Shalmaneser, S-H-A-L-M-A-N-E-S-A-R, descended upon Israel, he did not disturb those portions of the tribe of Dan and Simeon, which were dwelling on the southwest coast of Palestine. For the kingdom of Judah was there at peace with Assyria and lay between them and Samaria. However, both Dan and Simeon had large colonies in the interior, Dan in the north, Judges 18, and Simeon in the east at Mount Seir. Uh, Seir was the abode of Esau, the region formerly occupied by the Amalekites. And that's in 1 Chronicles 4, 42 and 43. Uh, Amalek and the Amalekites were uh, grandchildren of Esau. These portions of Dan and Simeon went with the rest of Samaria, Israel, into Assyria, and with them passed out through the Caucasian Pass. The territory into and through which the ten tribes made their escape was just north of the Caucasus, which in ancient geography, as may be seen by consulting ancient maps, was known as the territory of the S Samaritans while the pass or gate was sometimes called the Sumerian gate. Not a few have shown and upon good grounds that the name of Samaria was derived from, well, yeah, Samaria. The earlier home of these wandering people whose general name was themselves was um, S-C-O-L-O-T-I, but whom the Greeks called Scythians or nomads. From that word S C O L O T I, we have the more modern name Scotti, S C O T I, and still the more modern Scots, which of course means a name as the Greek, Scythian, and Normans, i.e., wanderers. But this is only one of the many names by which these wanderers or Scots may be traced for in their western march across the European continent, which was necessarily slow, Ephraim did obey the prophetic injunction, set thee up waymarks. And that's in Jeremiah 31, 21. And just here we must keep in mind the fact that in the ancient Hebrew, there are no written vowels and that in the word Dan, there are only two letters used, which is equivalent to the English D and N. Hence, it makes no difference if the word is Dan, Don, Dun, Din, or Den. D-A-N-D-O-N-D-U-N-D-I-N or D-E-N. It is equal to the Hebrew D-N, in which the speaker sounds the vowel according to the characteristics of his own dialect. On the west side of the Black Sea, there is, according to ancient geography, a region 
which is called M-O-E-S-I-A, signifying the land of the Mosesites and the people of which were called M-O-E-S-I or Mosesites. These people had such great reverence for a person whom they called uh, Zalmoxus, whom Herodias, the father of history, supposed to be their god and concerning whom he concludes his account as follows. Zalmoxus must have lived many years before Pythagoras. Bob's note here, if you don't know who Pythagoras is, um, perhaps you've heard of the Pythagoras. Well, I better look it up. All right, uh, Pythagoras, P-Y-T-H-A-G-O-R-A-S, was a philosopher, Greek, and historian. And perhaps you've heard of the uh, Pythagorean um, theorem. He, uh, if you had a right angle uh, triangle, you, he was, you know, mathematics. You can look it up. Um, it's P-Y-T-H-A-G-O-R-E-A-N-T-H-E-O-R-E-M. Two words, Pythagorean theorem. So you could uh, determine the distance of a right angle um, triangle. And yeah, that's geometry. So, but according to this, uh, let's see. So this Zal Moxus must have lived many years before Pythagoras, whether therefore he was a man or a deity of the uh, G-E-T-A-E, Enough has been said of him. Uh, T.R. Howlett says, Zalmoxes, whom Herodias supposed them to worship as God, is without a doubt Moses. Zal, signifying chief or leader, while Moxes and Moses are but the Greeks, are but the Greek for the Hebrew Mosey, which is also rendered Moses in our tongue. Mosey was bounded on the south by Mace Don Bonilla and the Dan uh, Dardan Ellis, and on the north by the river Danube, D-A-N-U-B-E. Funny, there's a river, a major river in Europe called the Danube. Perhaps you've heard of Strauss and his Blue Danube. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's the Bob comment. Is it a coincidence, the Danube River? Hmm, yeah, what a coincidence, huh? In the territory of Samar Samaria, which in some maps is Scythia, in others, Gomer, there are rivers, Daniper, Danister, and the Don. The fact that the Danipur and the Danister are written without a vowel between the D and the N is quite as significant as the fact that the Don has one. Professor Totten says, there is no grander theme upon the scrolls of history than the story of the struggle of the Anglo-Saxons westward. The very streams of Europe's mark, their resting places, and in the root of nearly all their ancient names, Dan or Don, recall the sacred stream, Jordan River. The river Jordan, Jordan, you know, the Jordan River. Uh, who did John the Baptist baptize people? Where? Where was Jesus baptized? The Jordan River. The River of Rest, from whose banks so far away as exiles they set out, it was either the little colony of Dan obeying its tribal proclivity for naming everything it captured, Judges 18, 1 through 12 and 29 after their father or else the mere survival of a word and custom but nonetheless it serves to trace their wanderings like a trail hence the danube the dan 
I-E-P-E-R, the Dan, I-E-S-T-E-R, the Dan Al, Dan In, Dan Aster, Dan Dari, Dan Itz, the Dancy, the Davi, the Dan, the Don, the Udon, the Eridon, and the thousand other Dans and Dons of ancient and early geography down to the Danes in Dan, E-V-E-R-K-E, -E, or Dan's last resting place. To this we would add that during all these years of blindness concerning the birthright tribes, the people of Denmark have been called Danes, D-A-N-E-S, and that the people in continuous countries, while having different local names, have been called by the same generic name. Scandinavians, S-C-A-N-D-A-N-N-A-V-I-N-S. You ever heard of Scandinavians? Scandinavia, Scandanavia. Also that Denmark, the modern form of Danmark, means Dan's Mark. That too to the people of the lost birthright. The very people who have hunted most for the waymarks which God told them to set up. All that Scandinavian country and much more once belonged to Denmark, which is now reduced to a comparatively, uh, comparatively small region. Yet we believe that little kingdom will stand until the end of this age, while dying Jacob called his sons together about him, that he might tell them what their posterity should become in the last days. He began his prophecy concerning Dan as follows. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Then immediately following is the expression, Dan shall be a serpent by the way. Isaac Leeser's translation. In this prophecy, Jacob does not say as many seem to think that Dan in the last days shall become the ruler of other tribes of Israel. For the eternal one has said, Judah is my lawgiver. But what Jacob does say is that Dan, as one of the tribes of Israel, shall render a verdict or judge his people Israel. How? Because he shall, like a serpent, leave his mark or trail that Israel may find it in the last days, and that they may say, There is one of the lost tribes of Israel. When this verdict has been rendered, then Dan will have judged his people Israel, it may be that the word Israel, as used in the prophecy above, is used in the broadest sense and includes both the house of Israel and the house of Judah. We are inclined to, to this opinion for reasons which follow. When Dan was born, Rachel said, um, now remember, uh, Jacob had two wives, Rachel and Leah. Jacob loved Rachel. Leah, he was tricked into marrying and not so much happy with her. I wonder if Rachel was a beauty and Leah was kind of plain. I don't know. The Bible says she was tender-eyed. What does that mean? Cross-eyed? I don't know. But, uh, when Dan was born, Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. The word in Hebrew means judge, and Daniel means the judge of God. Thus Dan, judge, and El, God, hence Daniel, the judge of God. Thus Jacob, in his last day's prophecy concerning the tribe of Dan, plays on their tribal name and says the judge shall judge or in other words that Dan shall Dan what Dan shall Dan yes and he sure certainly has Danned or Daned ed d-a-n-e-d -D, and kept on Danning until he has given abundant evidence to his people that he is one of the tribes of Israel for they now see the mark of his trail, i.e. Dan. 
It is now more than 250 years since a Danish peasant who with his daughter was following their plow in their native country when the daughter's plow turned up a bright and glittering something, which upon examination proved to be a golden trumpet. It was taken to the authorities and beyond all doubt identified as one of the seven golden trumpets used in the altar service of the temple at Jerusalem. This trumpet, which is now in the National Museum at Copenhagen, and by the way, Copenhagen is the uh, capital of Denmark, Denmark, is ornamented with a lily and pomegranate, the lily being the national flower of Egypt and the pomegranate that of Palestine, thus showing the half Egypt and half Israelitish origin of the birthright nation of which the tribe of Dan was a part. Just before Moses died, he, like Jacob, gave prophetic uh, utterance concerning each tribe in Israel. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. What's a lion? It's a big kitty cat, right? King of the jungle, right? Oh, yeah. Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Bashan was on Palestinian territory. Hence, Dan is to leap from that territory, but it is left for history to tell where that leap landed him. And it is a well-authenticated fact that after the coast colonies of Dan and Simeon knew that their king and their brethren were defeated, you know, uh, Bob's note here, um, you know, during the Assyrian Empire, you know, when they invaded Samaria, the capital, and they defeated uh, the king of Israel, you know, Dan and Simeon said, uh, wait a minute here, our people just lost against the, uh, the Assyrian Empire, and if we stick around, we're going to end up in Assyria as slaves. So maybe we should get on our ships and hightail it out of here. What do you say? What do you say? So, and it is a well-documented fact that after the coast colonies of Dan and Simeon knew that their king and their brethren were defeated, then they embarked in their ships and fled to the islands of the sea, which are to the northwest of Europe. For the people who are known by all historians to have been the first settlers in Ireland are called T-U-A-T-H-A-D-E-D-A-N-E. A A N S uh, Tutha de Danans, which literally means the tribe of Dan. These Danans of Ireland correspond to the Danai of the Greeks and Latin Danaus and the Hebrew Dan. Bob's note here. Do you ever wonder why the you-know-whos starved the Irish in the potato Irish, uh, the Irish potato famine? I forget what year it was, but uh, it was like a hundred and something years ago. Um, I, some people say there was a, a disease that wiped out the potato crops. Others say that the you-know-whos grabbed all the food and let the people starve. Which is true, I don't know. One day we'll find out. But the Irish potato famine, look it up. The Lord by the mouth of the psalmist declares that he breaketh or driveth the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As the Sidonians, Sidon, yeah, Sidon, as those Sidonians from the port of Sidon are driven like Ephraim, west by an east wind, they not only leave their trail along the shores of the Mediterranean in dens, dens, and dons, but on the peninsula of Spain. Just before passing out through the strait into the great waters, they left a mark that remains unto this day. Medina and Sidonia that Dan's leap landed him in Ireland is evident, for in that island we found today uh, Dan's 
L O U G H, Dan Sauer, Dan Monism, Dun D A L K E, Dun Drum, Dun E Gal Bay, and Donegal City with Dun Glow and London Dairy. Ah, uh, boy, it's been so long since I've read this that I forgot all this stuff. Just north of them. But there is also Dingle, Dun Garvin, and Dunsmore, which means more Dan's. Dunsmore. <laughs> and really, there are so many more that we have no space for them except to mention Dangan Castle, where the Duke of Wellington was born, and to say that Dun in the Irish language means just what Dan means in the Hebrew, i.e., a judge. Hmm. It is remarkable that there is not a river Don in Scotland, but also a river D-O-O-N, and that there is also a river Don in England. Also that these countries are as full of Dan's, Don's, and Dun's as Ireland, for in them was not only such names as Dundee, Dunkirk, Dunbar, Dunraven, and many others, but the name of Dan, the son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of I, uh, Abraham, lies buried in the name of their capital cities, Edinburgh and London. Surely Don hath danned or judged among his people and thus fulfilled the sure word of prophecy. We are told that in the days of Solomon, every three years came the ships of Tarshish 860 years before Christ, we are told that Jonah went to Joppa, a seaport within the borders of Dan, and found a ship going to Tarshish, and that he took passage on it to go to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And yeah, I did a Bible study on uh, Jonah. You know, God said to Jonah, go east, but he decided to go to Tarshish, Spain, west. You know, trying to run away from the Lord doesn't work very well, as I found out. Uh, yeah. God will break you if he has to. Yep, God had to almost kill me to get my attention. <laughs> yeah. He got my attention, all right. He says, I got a job for you to do, Bob. Yes, Lord, I hope I'm partially fulfilling what you want me to do. Maybe not perfectly. Absolutely not perfectly, but yeah. So, uh, Jonah went to Joppa, a seaport within the borders of Dan, and found a ship going to Tarshish, and then he took passage in it to go to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Just how long the ships of Palestinian seaports had been replenishing or colonizing the isles even before the Assyrian captivity of the ten tribes is not known. But historians place the time as early as 900 BC, 900 years before Christ, right? This gives abundant time for some prince of the Zerah branch of Judah's family to have preceded Israel to the Isles and to have had a large colony even before the birthright went to Assyria an event which did not occur until 721 BC that one of those princes did precede Israel to the Isles of the Sea is evident first because God says he did and second because it is recorded in the Milesian M I L E S I N records of Ireland that the prince Haramon to whom Tiatifa was married was a prince of the T-U-A-T-H-A-D-E-D-A-A-N-A-N-S. The tribe of Dan, right? Remember that. Mark this. If that prince was a prince of the tribe of Dan, and authentic declare, history declares he was, then he was a prince of the family of Judah. For there can be no prince of Dan other than a prince of the royal family of his race. And that family has but one fountainhead, i.e. Judah, the fourth son of Jacob and 
Leah, to whom pertains the scepter blessing. But this rule seems to have worked both ways. For the royal, of, uh, for the royal family ensign of Judah is a lion. And since one of his whelps, a young lion, went to the Northwest Isles with Dan, as a matter of course, the ensign of his family, the royal family, went with him. That uh, thus it became associated with the uh, T U A T H A D E D A A N A N S, the tribe of Dan, and in time found its way into their national seal. Uh, it says, see the accompanying cut. And you can look at the, uh, I, I'll, I'll try to remember the seal of uh, uh, the national seal of Ireland, which shows lions. So the figure on the seal is described as a lion's whelp with a serpent's trail. The largest of these represent Denmark and the other two, Norway and Sweden, which were at the time under the dominion of Denmark. Um, a lot of people don't know it. Bob's note here. A lot of people don't know it, but Sweden was a major, major power about a hundred and something years ago. I don't remember the exact years, but they were absolutely a major power at one time. I mean, they were like, like Germany was. So, yeah. But then, um, when uh, Sweden, uh, they broke up its territories, which became Norway, Denmark, Finland, and what have you. So, uh, Sweden has very, very good um, iron ore, high quality steel. Uh, perhaps you've heard of the Tiger tank. The 88 millimeter cannon on the Tiger tank was invented by the uh, Swedish and they made them for Germany during World War II. Sweden was in a very, very bad position. Um, they pretty much remained neutral during World War II, but they were like, uh, you know, if we don't have trade with Germany, Germany is just going to invade us and take us over. But they were trying to remain neutral so that they wouldn't be bombed by um, the British and the Americans. So, you know, it was a bad situation all around. So, um, yeah. Yeah, sounds like I've read too much history, doesn't it? Yeah. It's the history of our people. But actually, it, it all boils down to Christ. And it's history is his story. So. All right. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.